Okay, so tonight I'm talking to a, a legend of county cricket and a legend of Stony Stratford cricket, uh, James Hildreth, almost 20 years as a professional with Somerset. And we've got James, the Stony Stratford beanie hat of truth, full of questions to ask you in a second. But first of all, for those that don't know, what's your connection with Stony? Uh, well, I was uh, born there, really. So I was uh, born in born in Milton Keynes, uh, raised in in Stony. My parents still live in in Calverton, uh, and really kind of started started my life there. Uh, my first first house was in Bletchley. Then we quickly moved to St Paul's Court in the High Street, um, where I'd kind of jump over the wall and go to the tennis club and the cricket club and and, and play football for Stony as well. So and we moved we moved house again in within Stony. So um, really, my life started there, and my sport sports started there as well. And then, um, and uh, like I said, my you know my parents are still there, and my dad's still involved in the club and goes down quite quite often to the the club as well. So um, so yeah, strong strong ties to to Stony. Played played some um, age group stuff, uh, cricket, um, and and at the football club as well. So yeah, wonderful memories of starting my my sporting career at Stony. Okay, well let's. Let's see what we've got in the hat. Loads oh, of no. questions. So, ah, <laughs> this one's come up very early. England, how close did you get to a call-up? Because obviously you've got a fantastic first-class record. I think it's 4,600. So was there ever a point when, when you nearly got that call? Well, you, well, I suppose you never know. Uh, you never know how close you are because they don't ring you and say, oh, I'm lucky, you were really close. Uh, so uh, I, I felt... Re- probably later on in my career quite close when there was other guys getting selected who weren't necessarily doing as well in on on the county scene uh but when i was probably playing my best cricket in my mid mid to late 20s england were number one in the world they had you know your petersons your bells strauss cooks flintoffs those kind of guys and um you, you you're struggling to get in that team however well you do so i think there was uh, i was i was quite aware of how good england were at that stage and you can only try and knock on the door and get some runs uh, domestically but really there were no opportunities uh, depending on if someone got injured or not so there wasn't much but uh, I guess you tend to get better the, the longer you don't play so it's um, my stats would suggest you know there's people getting selected now so Dan, Dan Lawrence in this Sri Lanka series averaging 38 with the bat so you you look people look now and think well your, your stats probably warrant a place but at the times when they're selecting squads uh, I probably didn't justify a place compared to the other guys that were getting selected at the time. Does it? I mean, I, I looked at your Lions record as well. I think it's eight games you played for Lions. You got a couple of hundreds, average 50 odd. Do you look back and feel frustrated you didn't get that call? Not really. I mean, it's I'm probably the only bloke in that Lions team that I played that didn't play for England, which is which is um, which is I suppose quite frustrating, but not not really. I mean. I, you can't live your life like that, I don't think. I think I might look back when I finish playing in 20 years' time and go, oh, I, I should have had a chance or I wish I did. But at the moment, while I'm, while I'm still kind of clinging on to a career, I, I, I don't think I can, can really um, look, look back like that. I think the, the, the thing for me now is trying to still find that motivation when the England stuff's done. Um, that's that's my, my biggest thing. And how can I, how can I have those goals now? Um, and what goals can I set myself that will keep me motivated to play domestic cricket? Because, you know, as a kid, all you want to do is play for England. And, and at the start of my career, that's all I wanted to do. So that's what, that's what your focus is every time you go into the nets. You're thinking, well, how can I oust the guys that are playing for England and score, score more heavily than them? So um, I, I guess you've always got to have something to focus on to try and um, keep your career going and keep pushing yourself. So... I guess that's where my focus is now and it's it's probably when I finish playing in, in 10 years that I'll look back and probably maybe with a bit of frustration that I didn't get a chance when I've, when I've um, seen other guys that have been given it. Okay, well, let's, let's delve back into that and see what else we can come up with. Uh, so this one. Ah, this, this is going back to the, the start of your career. And again, the wonderful Cricket Archive site has helped me with my research on this. <laughs> Under-19 World Cup. England got to the semis, and I think you top scored in the semi final or, or, or did pretty well. Looking at the team from that day, seven of the guys ended up playing, I think, international cricket, including Sir Alistair Cook. 
is there anyone in that team that you thought that would make it that didn't? Or putting that question the other way around, anyone that you were really quite surprised with the progress they made after the under 19 series? Not really. I mean, to be honest, by that stage, you're probably playing county cricket. You've got a pretty good idea about how good some of these guys are. So I was looking at some guys there, the Ravi Bapara, Samit Patel, Luke Wright, um, Alistair Cook, and going, God, these guys, you know, they, they've got massive potential. They could easily go on. Um, the, the England under-19s team is usually a good breeding ground for, for the full England team. So you see, see a lot of guys going from that under-19. Um, someone like uh, Cookie, he almost went straight in, you know, from that England under-19 team and, and being captain and doing really well in that. It wasn't long before he was then playing test cricket. So... Um, I was probably surprised that the speed he went, went in at Test Cricket, but, you know, not surprised at all with how well he's done. He's an unbelievable player. And um, you're looking at the raw talent of Ravi and Samet and just thinking these guys just, yeah, they look, they look brilliant. And I'm, I'm not surprised at all that a lot of them went on to play, you know, for the full, full side. Uh, I can't think, there was a guy, I think a bowler there within the squad called David Stiff, who would bowl absolute rockets at the time, under-19s. Had a county career as well, but you know had all the attributes: tall, fast, bold, rapid to to go on and play at the highest level. So uh, maybe not surprised. I was probably a bit disappointed he didn't necessarily go on and reach the heights that I think a lot of us thought he could. Okay, uh, right. Back into the hats. Okay. Hopefully, this will be watched by lots of people, including a lot of our young players. And obviously, as you know, Stony has. I, mean, I think I saw you last season walking around Campbell for a third team game. So you probably saw some of the young players that we've got at the club. If you had one piece of advice for those guys and girls watching, what would it be? I think it, it's like what everyone says. That you've got to just keep enjoying it. I think cricket is a sport which is unlike a lot of others where you can be put down a lot playing cricket. When you're actually playing in terms of your own performances, you as a batter, statistics will tell you, you you generally fail more times than you succeed because you always want to go out and get a 50 and 100. And as a bowler, you're not going to get five wickets every time you bowl. So it's just maintaining that enjoyment and that love for the game, which I think will allow your cricket to progress in whatever way you want it to. But it's always got to come back to you. have just got to keep loving it. I know it's something that as a, as a professional and the guys we speak to, it's just keep trying to maintain that because it's so hard to lose, lose sight of that. So I think for youngsters, just don't be afraid to try things. Enjoy your, enjoy your cricket. There's no one way of, of doing something in cricket. Um, a good technique is a, a technique that does something consistently well. So uh, don't worry too much about how it looks. If it's, if it's squirrely runs and, and you're not getting out, then that's absolutely fine. As a bowler, it, it might look a bit odd, but if it's, if it's safe from a physical point of view then then keep going with it um you see you see batters on the tv you know steve smith for australia the best guys in the world and they're unorthodox uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not right so i think just keep just express yourself enjoy your cricket and um and don't worry about the down times because um yeah you, we all experience a lot of them but try and maintain that enjoyment all right next one out of the hat right so Again, research has told me, correct me if I'm wrong, at one point you were good enough at sports to play at quite a high standard for quite a lot of different sports, including apparently football for Luton. Was it ever a situation where you maybe either had to choose between sports or maybe you look back now and think, maybe I should have gone down the Joe Hart route and been a pro footballer instead of a pro cricketer? <laughs> I think uh, I absolutely loved playing football and playing for Stony Age Group for Stoney was just some of the, the best sporting experiences I've had really for that pure enjoyment of playing sport and I absolutely loved it and yeah played you know age group Luton Town stuff which which was great fun I think how my life panned out is that um, I went to boarding school in Somerset where I am now so that's that's how I've ended up in, in Somerset and I, I came down here when I was uh, 10 so I think when I went to the school I did I got the opportunity to play lots of sports and naturally um because of different terms and different sports you play i started I, I guess progressing more at cricket um hockey was a sport that i played quite a lot but i didn't personally see a future in it um i didn't see how i'd go off and, and make lots of money and, and pay the bills playing hockey so I, cricket naturally kind of um came to the forefront i think i went to a school where 
I played football and, and played a lot of football, but actually if you want to make it in football, then you probably need to go down a different route to the one I did. So um, I think that was probably off the cards quite quickly. And cricket was one of those that I've, I've always loved playing cricket. So summer sport and did okay at it. It's actually quite a, how I progressed was in quite a simple way. You play for your county age group and, and just work your way up and, and you're in the system then and you're getting identified by coaches and it's a natural progression to uh, to the top really. So um, it, was, it was probably a natural, I, I, there was never a point where I just thought I've got to pick one sport over the other. I think cricket just started uh, excelling more than any others. All right, let's give it a bit of a shake and see what comes out this time. Ah, <laughs> this is one that's come from a lot of people. Um, you know, you, you talked earlier on about not wanting to give up the county game just yet. But I know, I think you played third team cricket for us. And I, I know people like Jamie Bax, the first team skipper at the moment, are asking, is there ever going to come a day when we're going to see you putting on a, a first team shirt for Stoney? I hope so. I'd, do you know what? I'd absolutely love to. Uh, you know, I've still, still come back to Stoney all the time. You know, I've seen seen all the youngsters on a Friday night and um, fingers crossed we can all get back to those times again. So, uh, you know, I've, I've got a couple of years left playing, I think, um, professionally. And then after that, I would, you know, I'd absolutely love to bring back so many great memories. My dad played for Stoney for, for years, wicketkeeper for the, the first team. So, um, yeah, to, to have a game for Stoney with, with your old man watching, that would be, that'd be pretty special, I reckon. Well, I think there's a question about it in the hat, but I'll ask it while I think about it. I think, You've only got one year left on your contract at Somerset. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one. But obviously you've got former teammates like Marcus Triscothic who carried on playing for quite some time. Do you know at this point when the end point is going to come for you or are you still keen to play for a few more years? Well, I've just, I've just signed a one-year extension. So uh, I'll have this summer and next summer. And beyond then, I mean, it's kind of... I, I got injured last year. So the body, I don't know if the, what the body's starting to say to me. Um, you need to be scoring runs. We've got a lot of really, really good young players that are performing well and started performing in first team. So you, I'm going to be under the pump as well from from the youngsters. So you just can't look too far ahead. But I've got a couple of seasons left. I'll be 38 then. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably a, a pretty good time to to try and work out what I'm going to do next. So we'll just pencil you in for 2023. First game of the yeah. season in the North Ends Cricket <laughs> League for our first thing. Right. Now, this, this goes back to what you've said about the younger players. And, you know, obviously there's Lamanby, who's, who's done pretty well. And Tom Banton is a guy I think we've all seen doing stuff for Somerset in the Blast and obviously internationally. Do you look at him and think, wow, it's almost a different game because of the shots he's playing? And do you, do you find, you, even at your stage of your career, do you find yourself learning things from him about how he goes about it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, cricket has just changed dramatically basically during my career I started at the same time as 2020 in the professional game really so just I've seen the progression of how that format's evolved and the shots that are, that are happening so I've kind of had to adapt with the times to, to try and keep up with it just to just to play in the format uh, so that's been fascinating to watch that but what you have now is is younger guys that are targeting that because that's where all the the kind of glamour is so you have some youngsters coming onto the scene now who who probably don't think too much about Red Bull cricket. They want to be playing in the IPLs with big bashes, earning their millions of dollars, and I, I can't blame them at all. But yeah, what you see is 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 guys coming in playing the most ridiculous shots. I mean, Tom Banton reverse sweeping, you know, 90 mile an hour bowler over point for six, and you're thinking, yeah, this is the game has changed here. I'd be trying to nudge that down to third man for one, hoping it beats third man, but it's it's brilliant, you know. It's the way cricket's going. We've got the uh, the hundred, which I know is controversial, but but next year, so uh, cricket has to adapt, and uh, it's been fascinating watching it as well. I mean, when when twenty twenty first started, it was it was gimmicky. It was you know nicknames on the back of your shirt and have a massive slog, and no one really cared about it, and just no one realised actually the influence that's going to have on the rest of the game. You're seeing guys coming through twenty twenty and then going on to play test cricket like a David Warner without playing many first class games at all so the the routes in are different now whereas before it was you'd play your test cricket work your way and then you'd play in the one day team and there wasn't any 2020 cricket now you can get into the test team 
by slogging it in, in 2020 cricket. Like, so it's, it's fascinating how cricket's changed. Um, and hopefully it, it keeps evolving. You know, we all want to, we all want to see it. I'm, I'm a purist at heart. I love Red Bull cricket and batting for long periods of time. And you speak to any professional cricketer, they'll still say uh, the longer formats and Red Bull cricket is, is without a shadow of a doubt, the hardest format to play. Um, so uh, we, we all know that, but people, it's getting new audiences and people want to see sixes and, and wickets and boundaries. And yeah, that, that's also great. Do you ever think in a way that you wish you were starting perhaps now and you could maybe get a piece of the franchise cricket yourself? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I would approach it differently if I started now. I, I definitely have an eye on that, you know, a little thing like I'd probably get an agent early on just because they can they've got influence with those kind of tournaments I don't put myself in those tournaments, but I'd be putting myself in straight away when I was a youngster. Uh, making a scene on, in, on the domestic circuit, I was just so um, kind of passionate about trying to play well in Red Bull cricket and score hundreds. I think guys now are thinking, right, this is we're playing 2020 cricket or one day game. We're on TV. The sky cameras are here. If I can, if I can have an impact here, this can fast track me to to playing um, high levels and, and earning lots of money. So I think if I started now, I, I wouldn't be able to help but have an eye on that because someone like Tom Banton, who's 19, 20 years old, or whatever he is, he you know he's going off to the PSL, the Big Bash, the IPL, playing for England. Uh, he's he's going to be earning a lot of money and playing in those tournaments that don't take it out of you too much physically, but um, you know, you're getting all the, the attention and, and the lights as well. So yeah, I think, I think I probably would have approached it differently if I, if I started now, I wouldn't just be a blocker who nicks it down to third man all the time. As someone who does that for Stoner's third team, there's no problem in that sort of <laughs> approach. Now I know there's a question in the hat somewhere about this, but as we're talking about it, the hundred, what are your thoughts on it? So I, I struggle with it a little bit because of how well our 2020 product is. I think it works. So why jeopardize that? Um, the argument around getting new audiences in, I can't see how someone would think, I'll go and watch a hundred ball game, but I've got no interest in 2020. It's just far too different to the hundred ball. Uh, so, but then if I, if I take a step back and if we want to get more money into cricket and um, if it wants to be seen on, on TV more and on, you know, BBC, then that's a good thing if we can get more exposure to cricket and more people into it and maybe getting it over to the other countries and Olympics and where people want to take cricket, then, it, then it's got to be a good thing bringing in new sponsors. Um, I, I don't think we need four formats. I think it's, it's quite tricky to get all of that into a, a domestic season. Next season with the, the 100 ball is at the same time as a 50 over competition. So when I'm playing in the 50 over competition, you know, there'll be the standard will be lower. There'll be second team players playing, and I'm I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I suppose I'm sitting on the fence here. Ultimately, it's hopefully it's bringing in some more money and more exposure into cricket, which is a good thing. Do I like it as a, a format? Obviously, never seen it, but at the moment, I'd probably say no. I, I, I like 2020, and I, I like the three formats that we had before that. So um, I'm going to have to be persuaded for it to to be a success. Have you had a chance to play in it? Because I know there was there was a game a couple of years ago which I think people like Daryl Mitchell were playing in. So have you even had a chance to sample it? No, we, we were playing a four-day game at Knotts and they had their trial games. I think Peter Trigo played played for us, uh, went and had a go in it, and they said it was okay. You know, they were they were all trying to get their heads around it really when they were playing it, um, with the, the, the number of balls in an over, it's not an over, number of balls each end, and uh it's just gonna take some some working out, I think. So uh, yeah, I think viewing, I mean, they, they don't worry about getting people in the ground. It's not about selling tickets. It's about the audiences and, um, well, as you'd know, getting people watching on TV. That's how they, they make their money and, and sell it. So that's what they'll be pushing. Even if there's no one watching it in the grounds, they'll be saying, yeah, but it doesn't matter because we're getting X number of million watching it on TV. So, uh, you know, if, if more people are watching cricket, it makes more people passionate about playing cricket and it gets more people into clubs like Stoney and other clubs and at that grassroots level, then, then I'm a massive fan of it. Okay, back we go into the hats. Let's see what we've got now. Right. Okay, you, you sort of touched on this earlier on, I think, but if there was one thing from your 20 years or so as a pro that's changed, what would it be? Would it be things like the, the new formats coming in? Yeah, so there's, 
I feel like I've, I've, my career has changed with the, the times really in terms of I, when I started, I, I had a game up in Durham and I was, uh, well, I was 12th man for the four day game, played the one day game. We went up there and uh, it was right, meet in the bar for a beer before the game. And we all sat there and had a beer. And if you didn't go, they'd be like, well, what are you doing? This is a team, you know, team, team spirit. Let's go and have a, a beer. Uh, and that was just the dumb thing. You know, when I first couple of years I started, you have to, there was compulsory 30 minutes after the day of every four day game to go into the bar and have a drink with the members. You didn't have to have a, an alcoholic drink, but a lot of the guys did. It was, it was just what happened then. You, the, the senior guys that I played with, the Pete Bowlers, the Caddicks, the Jamie Coxes, they'd order a bottle of bud for the end of the day's play. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't an odd thing. Um, whereas another thing that's changed in cricket massively is, is fitness because of 2020 fitness, diet, nutrition, uh, strength and conditioning, coaches. That's, that's just changed hugely as well in, in my time from, from playing with you know, people like Ian Blackwell, who wasn't a massive fan of, of all that kind of stuff and just a brilliant bloke. But um, that was just the way cricket was back then when I started. And then it's, um, yeah, it's, it's changed a lot. So that outside of just playing, that, that's, that's changed hugely. But obviously cricket has as well because of what we, we've spoken about earlier with all the adaptations of, of white ball cricket. Do you feel, because we, we get the same village level where, as you say, 20 years ago after a game, You'd all sit in, in the bar. Obviously, we can't sit in bars at the moment because of COVID. But do you think, you know, sharing the spoils with the opposition after the game, talking things through, that not happening as much now, do you think that the game's poorer for that? Yeah, I definitely think it's lost something for that. I, you know, that, that socialising after a game, having a beer, you might have had a bit of sledging during the game, but then, then settle it and have a beer and just talk about cricket. If, ever, if if you love cricket, you like talking about it, and just I think they're pretty special times if you can do that with with the opposition, but with your teammates as well. And um, you know, it's good times. I'm sure I'm sure people look back on those now who when they used to do that and think, oh, I wish it was still like that. But I, d I don't think it's a cricket thing. I think it's a, a society thing, cultural thing. Youngsters these days probably drink slightly differently, I guess, and socialise slightly differently than than when I started or, you know, a few years ago where it's kind of get in and get out and, um, yeah, get, get back home. Um, yeah, different pressures, different, just lots of different changes in society, not, not just cricket. But I definitely think if, if people could, could hang around in, in clubhouses and stay around just for a chat, that you learn, I think, more by just chatting to, to people about the game and, and then you do actually playing it often because you, you need, to, you know, it's kind of a nice way of reviewing it by by having a drink and just chatting to someone, and um, rather than just going and, and kind of stewing yourself at, at home. So, um, yeah, probably probably has lost lost something, I reckon. Right, this has come, I think, from the WhatsApp group that I'm part of, and it's an interesting one. How do you train yourself to pick up and face ninety mile an hour plus deliveries? Well. You, you or do you just duck you do well yeah yeah <laughs> well straight away you're going oh no oh no but it's just it's it's instinct you know you, you you practice it in the nets on the bowling machine or we've got some pretty quick bowlers we got we just signed a guy called Merchant Delanger who was at Glamorgan he bowls 90 plus uh, but really I think if you're talking about batting specifics the secret of batting to me is is not is not thinking it's having clarity and um, if you've done the practice and and you're not premeditating what the bowler's going to do as he's running in you can have some cues that you use which take all that that clutter away which is easy to say really hard to do then actually when you face those those 90 mile an hour bowlers as they're running in the worst thing you could be thinking was oh my god this bloke's bowling 90 mile an hour or i need to duck or if it's short, play this short, or I'm, I'm going to back away here, or I'm in fear. The, the the best way of playing them, which is so hard to do, is to just to just try and declutter declutter your mind really, and and that you can use whatever cues you want. You know, Tendulkar talks about just thinking about his breathing. Really, he's thinking about his breathing because he's not thinking bloody hell, Brett Lee's bowling at me. He's going to hit me in the head. He's just that's his focus. So, the, yeah, the 90 mile an hour bowlers are horrible, and they're not obviously easy to play and uh, get, I get in all sorts of trouble when I'm playing them. But I suppose my, in terms of my processes, that's what I try and do. Find my uh, 
um, singing a song or chewing gum or breathing or whatever it is to, to stop me absolutely cacking myself while I'm standing at the other end, really. Because you play for Somerset, do you have to sing the Wurzels? We, we, uh, we've got our team songs Blackbird. <laughs> so, uh, so we sing that after, yeah, after every win. So that is a, yeah, a bit of a bit of a routine for us, um, which the the boys love. Uh, yeah, so that's that's great fun. It's become a bit of a tradition. I have to say, last year when we were playing, there was no crowds. Everything was socially distanced. It, it was the most awkward because normally you, you're in a circle and you're all hugging each other as you know as you as you do, and you're singing a song and having a beer or whatever. But trying to do team songs socially distanced in different sides of the room all singing and jumping up and down was probably one of the more, more awkward moments of my life to be honest with you now we'll probably come back to, to covid and cricket there's, there's a question on that but there's also in here somewhere there's a question or well, a couple of questions relating to nice my hour bowling uh, so i'll combine them now How, what's the fastest spell of bowling you've ever faced and sort of similar but different have you ever been genuinely scared when you've been batting? And what was that like? So to answer the second question, I've never been genuinely scared. Uh, I, I just, it just wouldn't, it just doesn't work. You just, you, the, you've definitely got fear and nerves and anxiety and they're great, but in terms of being scared, I don't think I've ever been, been kind of scared, but those you get certainly get more anxious, more butterflies as the bowlers running in. Uh, yeah, and, and actually that works in your favour, you know, your adrenaline's pumping, you, you can you move quicker generally. So uh so that it's the answer. Probably the I faced yeah, a few of the, the quicker guys around. Well before some say used to face the touring teams all the time, the international guys. So you used to play against the Australias, Indias, West Indies, whoever, Pakistan probably played against most of them. So that that's when you face the, the quicker guys. Uh but when my the quickest one of the quickest spells I faced was in my my second game for Somerset. Actually, we played against Durham, and they had Shoah Bakhtar playing for them <laughs> at the time, and he bowled the speed of light. It's probably one of the quickest spells I've I've faced to this day um, in in some of the most bizarre situations. So it was my second game. I'm 18, 19 years old, with Jamie Cox at the other end, and uh, Shoah running in from the fence, bowling the speed of light at my head. Didn't know what I was doing, just trying to get out of the way of it, and. Uh, and after one ball, he came down the wicket and said something to me. And I have no idea what he said, but being young and stupid, I said something back to him, just, what are you doing? Which did not go down very well. So he's then gone back, turned it up about two or three miles an hour, to bowling the speed of light at me. And then I'd, you know, get one off my hip or whatever, managed to get a leg by, get down the other end. And then I was back with a guy called Jamie Cox. And he moved every fielder out onto the boundary, apart from the keeper. And it was just him and the keeper and the us two batters, and he bowl off three steps, give Jamie Cox a single, get me back on strike, everyone in again, back back bowling the speed of light. And that was my second game. And I genuinely thought, I'm going to retire here. I've had two games and I'm, I'm, I'm done. That's me. But he was probably, yeah, so he was probably the probably the quickest, most intimidating spell I've, I've faced. I'm sure you, you, you can when get the autobiography out. You can write a bit more about that one as well. Oh, we've done that one. That's about franchise cricket, so we'll, we'll power on through that one. Uh, right. This is an interesting one. Now, Crick Info has your nicknames as Hildy and Hilds. Are there any more dressing room only nicknames that you have that you can share with us, or, or would you prefer we just move on? <laughs> well, ge genuinely, oh, that's, it's so boring, but there isn't. I've just been Hildy since I've been about. Well, it was probably my dad was Hilders at Stony. I think he's still Hilders, and I've just been Hildy since I've been ten years old. And it, so that's no one calls me James. I don't respond to James. So it's just yeah. it's just Hildy, and I've literally been that ever since. So yeah, I don't, I'm, that's a pretty pretty dull answer. But yeah, there's no there's no like yeah nicknames that I can't share or anything like that. Right, um, we've done that one. That's about the hundred. Um... Ah, <laughs> you might laugh at this one. Or you might think, yeah, of course, absolutely. Can we expect at Taunton a James Hildreth stand or something to be named after you in the same way that we've got, obviously, with Ian Botham and Saviv? Or even Syrian? I, I doubt it. I don't know. You, you look around the ground and you've got, yeah, Triscothic, Caddick, Richards, Botham. I'm not sure Hildreth slots along, <laughs> slots along with those. So, uh, international cricketers, yeah. So, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I've, yeah, I've, 
yeah, played for the county for a long time, but those guys are, you know, they're proper legends. So um, I, I wouldn't mind a little bar or something, a little, little cafe, a little coffee shop somewhere. That'd be good. Well, maybe we'll get one for you down at Stoney. Might have answered this one with the show of Actar one, but funniest moment on a cricket field? Uh, there's been quite a few. Um, just stupid stuff. I played in a game once where uh, I was fielding at... Uh, mid off and there was a guy called Matt Wood and John Francis who were playing and trying to describe how they basically Matt Wood was at cover to a left hander picked the ball up was just um, sidestepping to throw it into the keeper meanwhile Point had run in front of him and, and Woody threw the ball straight into Point John Francis' head knocked him out Sparko that was, that, that was an interesting 10 minutes when that happened <laughs> They didn't even run or anything. It was just a gentle little little bit of fielding and he just uh, knocked him out. Well, I guess it happens, doesn't it? Right. Um, we've sort of covered that one. That's about Stony Stratford. This is good. We're making some progress through. Um, okay. Um, you talked a bit about Tom Banton. I mentioned uh, Lamanby as well. Who's the player to watch, do you think, in county cricket that maybe in two or three years' time We'll be cheering on playing for England. Uh, I, I mean, if I look at our place, we've got some, yeah, Banton, Lamanby, Bartlett's a good, really good young player for us. We had a guy called uh, Will Smead who came on the scene in, for us in 2020 last year uh, and did well. Looks looks a really good talent. So he's Will Smead's probably a name to, to look out for. Um, the other counties, I'm not sure who they've got coming through really, but. Um, yeah, probably probably Bartlett, Banton, Smead. Trying to think, I'll probably left someone out if they see this. They'll be disappointed. <laughs> but any of our youngsters can make it, obviously. Well, of course. 2005 Ashes. Now, we know about Gary Pratt's involvement as a subfielder, but I think I'm right in saying you were a subfielder as well. And I think, did you get Ricky Ponting out on a catch? Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, that was... Tell us that about was... Tell us about the whole 2000, well, just the whole process of being involved in something as serious as big as that. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously an amazing opportunity, but uh, nothing that I did really. They, they, at that time, the, the policy was they used to go around each of the counties that weren't playing uh, domestically and get two, two of the young fielders to come in and basically do 12th and 13th man for England during their test series. Uh, and that that used to happen, or it, or it doesn't happen anymore, um, because people kicked up too much too much of a stink. But myself and and John Francis at Somerset, it was our turn, Somerset's turn to to send some guys to England. And fortunately for us, it was you know, the first first Ashes Test in two thousand and five. So yeah, we travelled up there for for the game. You know, it was just unbelievably nerve wracking. Um, obviously, we had no idea about what the season was going to uh, the uh, uh, series was going to be like either, and just how how big it was but even then you know queues at Lords and Full House and getting a taxi with Flintoff and Harmison in the morning from the hotel it was it was so surreal as a as a 20 year old so yeah it was just basically our, our turn and uh, you're obviously sitting up there doing everything you have to do as 12th man getting the drinks and making sure Peterson's water's at the right temperature and various other bits and bobs making sure Triscothic's Toblerone's still in this spot and whatever you have to do is the 12th man so it's 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 quite quite busy especially at Lords it's quite hard ground to do because you're it's quite an awkward changing room and you've got to go in and out the long room and it's quite a long way to go so you basically just wait in the changing room when we're, when England are fielding and uh, and wait for the wave if ever, anyone needs to come off for any any reason so I think uh, and my first time I went on I think it was uh, Vaughan or someone um, wave to come off and they were fielding in the slips and because I knew Trez from, from Somerset, uh, I ran on and Trez went, oh, Hildy's fine in the slips, he can come in. So I had to stand at second second or third slip for England when I first went on with Harmison bowling at Warren going, oh, that is probably was gen that was probably when I was scared, actually, going back to what you said previously. That was that was I was petrified to be honest with you. Full house at Lords having to field it at slip. Luckily I only was on for an over, then could run off and um and get my breath back and and then it happened again and then I went out and the, the next time I yeah I filled it at a point and uh, Hoggard was bowling to Ponting and he he played a poor shot and, and cut one and 
uh, yeah, the ball ball luckily just came straight at me. Didn't have too much thinking time, which is always good, isn't it? When the ball's coming at you and managed to grab it and just, just basically held it like that. I just didn't want to let it go because I was like, please, please don't drop it. So, um, so yeah, just, just utter relief, really, that... Um, I managed to catch it, but it was it was weird. You just look back now, and actually, you think that was quite a special moment. Which at the time, you just you just don't think about it at all. But now, I still have the memory of, of running through the, the long room when it was when it was packed, and them all clapping, and just think, thinking nothing of it at the time. But now, looking back and going, actually, it was probably probably a pretty special time. Let's, let's get through a few. I, I'm guessing at some point it's going to chuck us off because I think I think we've got the 45 minutes, but I think we've got five or six minutes to go. So we'll, we'll we'll push through these a bit quicker if we can. So worst sledge you've ever got? Oh, sledging now is is terrible. It, sledging now is abuse. So it's nothing clever. Cricketers aren't very smart, um, and because of all the technology now, so uh, no, it's just it's just abuse. Just you you're rubbish. Obviously, not using using slightly more expletives than that, but but that's it. It's just general abuse. Okay, lockdown cricket, and also just your experiences of that last year, Bob Willis Trophy and everything like that. And on lockdown, what was the worst habit that you picked up? It doesn't have to be cricket related. Well, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I don't think I can answer that. Worst habit? I don't know. I don't think I picked up any habits. Got, well, got that's, three... that's absolutely fine. Um, okay. Three kids to look after. I didn't have time to pick up any habits. So, okay, 2020 cricket then, with the lockdown and stuff, was it, I mean, we obviously played it at village level and we were doing the old touching the elbows and things. What was that like as a professional? Because obviously you guys, were you on furlough for a while as well? Was it, was it, yeah. 2020 was a very weird experience, although by the end it got a bit better for Somerset getting to the final at least. Yeah, but it was it was it was brilliant. They were out there playing cricket, but just bizarre that you know there's no one watching. You get no tannoy, no atmosphere, uh, and that was that was you just want to see people in the crowds really. So uh, great that we were playing, but just felt like every game was a, a pre-season game, um, slightly less on it, even though there wasn't. It just it because it was truncated. That that actual before the Bob Willis Trophy, there was only a few games we played teams that uh, we hadn't played before in kind of second division cricket, probably standard was slightly lower. So uh, overall, very disappointing not to kind of see anyone. And especially when you got to the white ball stuff, playing 2020 cricket in front of no one, with no crowd, no music, no tamway was, was something hopefully I won't have to do ever again. I think it's still stuffed my county Worcestershire in the blast though, from memory. <laughs> um, this is going back to something we talked about really at the start, England. And you see quite a lot of players, and certainly quite a few, that have left Worcestershire in search of an international call-up, feeling they've got to go to a quote-unquote bigger, bigger county, a test match nation. Was that ever anything that you thought about? No, no. I've always, uh, rightly or wrongly, just, just loved playing for Somerset and wanted to, wanted to play for Somerset. I've never felt like there was a time when I, I needed to leave at the time. Uh, People might say I might have been better off going to a, a, a test match grounds, but I never felt like that. You know, there was people around me that were getting selected for England when I was doing well. I was getting, I was representing the Lions, so I never felt hindered by being at Somerset. I felt like if I did well at Somerset, then there's there's a good chance. Um, you did see other people uh, probably getting pushed ahead of you who were at grounds where they did have selectors. That's all changed now, but there was uh, England selectors that were also directors of cricket at at test grounds. So there's a slight conflict there, I think. And, and so you did see a little bit of bias there. But um, no, not really. The majority of the time, I, I felt like if I did well at Somerset, then I, I would have the chance to, to go on and play for England. OK. As I said a few minutes ago, I'm not quite, quite sure what's going to happen with Zoom, whether it will just cut us off in our prime or not. But we'll plough on anyway. Um, when you retire, what will you miss about pro cricket? I think, like like everyone says, it's the... It's the banter, it's the changing room bit, it's the friendships and the relationships you make. Um, you have you have a lot of downtime as well in cricket, a lot of uh, time to you know chill out, go for a coffee, see your mates. So there's a lot of the social bit. Um, I, I think I missed that. You'll ob I'll obviously miss the the feelings that you get about winning games with your mates or getting a hundred. 
um, playing on TV. Um, so I suppose the obvious things, you know. So yeah, that, that that's what I miss. Now you mentioned this guy earlier on, and this 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 has come up, and I don't really know whether you'll know the answer to this, but Pete Trago, exactly how many tattoos does he have? He has, well, majority. Well, I say majority of his body. He has a lot. Yeah, thighs, bum, everywhere. Yeah, absolute legend of a bloke. Yeah, he's yeah he's a right pirate. He's got yeah tattoos tattoos all over him. Um, yeah, one of the one of the great characters that I've played with. Um, yeah, yeah, brilliant guy. Uh, could we see a move into the media for you going forward? Uh, you do you do some banking at the moment, don't you? I think, and I've said some banking as if it's nothing, which obviously it is. But I mean, media is that something that you'd look at, or, or have you got an, an idea of what you want to do next anyway? Well, I've I've started doing yeah the kind of do two days a week in the the private banking stuff. I think media is. I th- I'd love to go into media, but it seems like you almost have to be an England captain to, to go into Sky. There's obviously other opportunities, but to be honest, I haven't really explored those. Um, it's probably not an area that um, I've ever really thought about. I you know, do interviews and stuff, but I've never thought I'm going to pursue that as something I can do as a career. Um, yeah, so so probably not. I don't. I probably shouldn't say that to you, should I? But yeah, probably not. I'm not taking offence to it. Don't worry. Right. Uh, okay. So career highlight and, and any regrets? I'm sorry if we're rushing through this. I'm just trying to get as many out as we can. Yeah, no, career highlights would be uh, the two trophies out of one, 2020 trophy, 2005, and then the one day cup a couple of years ago. Um, there'd be, yeah, two highlights, winning trophies. Ooh. Is it gone? No, I, I can still see and hear you, I think. Okay, that's fine. I'm getting an update thing, but yeah. Um, yeah, so there'd be the two... I can't see you by the way, but um, <laughs> they'll be yeah, they'll be my two highlights. And then uh, the other question was, what was the other question? It was regrets, I think. Regrets, probably. To be honest with you, not taking the Somerset captaincy would probably be a big regret of mine. I got offered it quite a few times, and it never felt like the right time. But now, at the end of my career, I think that's probably my my biggest regret. Right, remarkably, I've just gone through the hat very quickly. And everything that's in the hat, we've sort of covered. Oh, brilliant. So I think unless there's anything else you'd like to add, I'd be happy to say thank you very much, James Hildreth, and uh, in, good luck with the, the season ahead. No, thank you very much. No, it's been great. And, and yeah, good luck to, to Stoney and kind of wish, wish everyone there the best and getting through this, obviously, this, this tough time. And hopefully we can just have a normal normal season next season and um, and get some cricket going. Like us, follow us, watch us. It's Stony Stratford Cricket Club.